Okay, fantastic. We're here with Janine Peoples, NSCF coach. Welcome, Janine. Hi, thanks for having me, Maggie. So today we wanted to learn a little bit more about you, your coaching style, your background, your experience. The very first question I have for you is to tell us more about yourself. Yeah, it's always such a fun question. Um, I guess I'll start with my undergraduate career. Um, received my Bachelor's of Science in Health and Human Performance from the University of Memphis. I then went on to pursue and receive a Master's of Science in Health Education from Texas A&M University. And if that wasn't enough, I'm now a PhD student uh, in social work at Washington University in St. Louis. So I'm a lifetime learner, um, needless to say. And honestly, before I started pursuing my PhD, I spent several years at Vanderbilt University as an academic and well-being coach. Um, in this role, I had the pleasure to support hundreds of undergrads, grads, and professionals in the area of the areas of executive functioning, perfectionism, mindfulness, health behavior change, and ultimately just supporting and helping them devise action plans that really help them get to their goals. Um, so that's kind of the quick version of my background. I mean, you covered so much. <laughs> and what's so fascinating to me when you say perfectionism, and then you say mindfulness, and then you say academic well-being, and, you know, academic coaching, it, it's just incredible. I know you have experience and could deep dive into every single one of those subjects. I hope today we can learn a little bit more about you know, kind of the nuts and bolts about who, what makes you who you are, and also perfectionism. I just can't help but think about that. So I'm going to table that and come back to it because I know it's an area of passion of yours. But first, let's kind of widen the lens and think about executive functioning. So how would you define executive functioning? Yeah, so I define executive functioning as, I think of cognitive processes, just mental skills such as our working memory, our cognitive flexibility, self-regulation that ultimately enable us to be successful and manage our everyday life. Um, I think it's, I mean, it's so core, it's just a core capability that we need as humans to function and show up. And I would define it as again, a set of skills that you need in every area of your life. And so it's not just academic base. It's not just related to your occupation or your vocation, but honestly, how you handle your finances, how you're able to regulate your emotions and how you understand others' perspectives. Executive function is just quite literally what we need to be successful and successful meaning just show up and live in a present way and manage and maintain our lives and so I would just yeah I think that's how I would define it is just something that is so critical and essential to how we manage our lives. Yeah I, I love that answer and it just reminds me of sometimes when we're asked for a definition of something I like to give what it's not. So if it's hard to define happiness or health or executive functioning, sometimes, you know, I find it useful to say, well, what's, what's not happening? So it's not that executive functions isn't happening. Those, you know, our brain still exists. Our brain is still there. But I think you put it beautifully. It's when we're unable to manage, we're unable to function, we're unable to be that driver of our own life. That's where things get complicated. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, so you've helped us define executive functioning. Talk to us about how you serve in the role of an executive functioning coach. How do you start to bring a client who says, yes, 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 I'm with you, me, 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 or this is my child. Very capable, very smart. Executive functioning has nothing to do with intelligence, as we well know, right? This is not about how smart I am or how capable I am. It has everything to do with, am I able to function? And when that's interrupted, how can I help? So how do you help when a client comes to you and says, I'm lost. I don't know what to do. Where do you go from there? Yeah, Maggie, you bring up such key words of you can be successful, you can do well and still need to develop certain skills. 
Um, and I can honestly say with working with hundreds of bright adolescents and college students, a lot of time, like you said, it's not intelligence. It has, it's not that at all. What happens is you don't know that you need a skill until you need a skill. And what I found very prevalent in my work with students and adolescents is a lot of times clients would come to me saying, I've never needed a planner. I never needed to break down tasks into manageable pieces. I've never had to think about these things when I perform in my high school career. But now that I'm in a more rigorous space, now that I'm in a more mentally challenging space, I'm not functioning well. Um, you know, just not to play on the word function, but seriously, I'm not functioning well. What do I do? And so for me, I like to, that's a good opportunity to step in as a coach and say, let's identify the barriers. Right, you know, what's currently going on? And I'm so whole person centered that I, even if a client works in my walks in my office and says, Hey, I'm here for time management, I want to know how is your emotional well being? How is your home environment? How are you handling other stressors in life? Because what I find is a lot of times there's so many other contributing factors that it's not just the time and the management of time. And so, as a coach, I want to identify those early on. Um, if I'm working with younger clients, I even like to talk to their parents and see what the parents are seeing at home and what patterns exist so that I have a better idea. And then we can formulate a plan. I never just want to jump into a plan without really understanding the full scope of where a client is. And so for me that, you know, it may be in the form of a questionnaire. Maybe I want to know where we're starting at baseline and what are some of your strengths? What are some of your areas of growth? And then we we make a plan from there. So I, I like to start being very broad and seeing what's going on. And then we can hone on into why you're, you know, the presenting issue. I love it. I love it. Well, you talked about presenting issues. And one of the things, and you also used the word holistic, which is so definitive of who you are, right? And your approach to coaching, your approach to really helping people. And... Um, we are strengths-based at North Shore Executive Function. We like to talk about the strengths that clients bring to the table, and we like to figure out where they're stuck. So my question for you is, what are your strengths? What do you bring to the table? Such a good question. I, oh man, I love this question because it's, I think about when how I have developed strengths over the years, and I'm at a point where resilience and adaptability are some of the top strengths of mine. And I mentioned earlier that I'm a doctoral student. So I'm a literal student and I'm a student to life. And what I have learned is you can have the most perfect plan. You can have the most just detailed, smart goal written out and life will still happen. And so I consider myself a very organized person. I'm a planner, right? Like I, I'm accountable. I know how to hold myself accountable, and life still happens. And so what has been, honestly, when I think about how I've reached certain milestones and accomplishments in my life, it's not from being perfect. It's not from never having to be flexible. It's from always having to be flexible and what that really means. And so I say that as a strength because, you know, not to you know sound too deep, but it's really not in how things go perfectly. It's how you bounce back from it and what you're going to do to adjust your plan Let's look at the current circumstance and how do we move forward? And that is something that I've deeply instilled in myself. And I like to help my clients understand as well as we're not, I'm not helping you make a plan so that you cannot deter from it. I'm helping you make this plan so you have a starting point. And I'm telling you, there's going to be a bump in the road and we're going to have a plan for that as well. So that's kind of where I am with those strengths. And I, I really do see them as strengths. I love it. Absolutely, their strengths. Okay, you use the word perfect, and we talked about perfectionism. I am dying for you to tell us more about your work with perfectionism, your you know research around it, your interest, your experience. Tell us. I love perfectionism because it's so deeply rooted into who I have been growing up. Um, through grade school, as a young adult, now as an you know, adult, and I see it so much in my clients. And it's quite literally just the idea that either I've adopted a mindset that I have to do everything right all the time, or someone else has placed that on me. 
Either way, I now move through life thinking that setbacks are failures. And to me, I really love the science and just the, even the realization that setbacks are just that. They set you back for a little bit. They're learning opportunities. They're not failures. And I think the word when people equate, you know, if I'm not perfect, I'm failing, right? So just to give more concrete examples with a lot of the students that I would meet with at Vanderbilt, it was, I have never gotten, I'm quite honestly, I've never gotten a B in my life. I have never in my life gotten a B and I'm doing everything right. Like, why am I failing at life? And we would have those conversations of what about a B is failing to you? You know, how to, what about everything else that is going on and the pressures that you're dealing with? You know, how do you overcome challenges, but do it in a way that still allows you to be human? And that's what I love about the science of perfectionism and trying to ultimately change mindsets that you not only don't need to be perfect, but you just can't. You can't. And it, it, it honestly leads to so many um, unhealthy habits that it almost takes the joy out of life. And it makes you feel like you're always so focused on this one goal and you have to define what success looks like for you. And that's how I have adopted a mindset of not what, you know, X, Y, and Z told me that I should be good at, not what I was good at in high school, but who do I want to be now? And I can change that. And I think that's really powerful. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing your own experience because who we are, what we bring as coaches to the table informs how we do our work. You know, it's not that we're inserting our own experience or projecting our story onto somebody else, but really that human element of, I can relate, I can empathize. You know, I've either gone through this before or I've had clients that have gone through this before. So thank you for sharing that. And there was something, I, I frankly am just gonna claim ignorance. I can't remember what you called it. You created a program at Vanderbilt like imperfect to be or something? <laughs> That's a good way. Yes. Yeah, so it was called the Imperfection Project. Awesome. And I, just to give you a little background or whoever's listening, it's so it's a project that focuses on raising awareness about the culture of, and the detrimental culture of perfectionism. And so we would hold events where all students could come and say, look, I'm dealing with X, Y, and Z. Maybe it's the loss of social support. Maybe it's failing a class for the first time in my life ever. Maybe it's being diagnosed with a, you know, a mental health condition and I don't know what to do with it. And they would literally stand in front of their peers and share their stories. Uh, we called them stories of imperfection. And I'm telling you, Maggie, the rapport and the bonding that happened during those meetings where someone would look at another student and say, wow, I thought I was the only one. I thought I was the only one dealing with that. I didn't know that that was normal. And so that was kind of the, I would say, grounding of the project was just raising awareness and doing it in a way, we call them speak outs, or speak out events where students could share, we would host, you know, allow them to write. Some people aren't comfortable talking about it, but they may want to anonymously share their story. And it was the power of storytelling that ultimately let students know I don't have to be perfect, I don't need to be, and I can still be successful as a student. I love it. And on the other end, there are probably lots of parents and adults listening going, I identify, me too, I understand, I would be at the speak out. What about, on, maybe it's not the other side, but what about those who go, okay, perfection is not the issue in myself or in my child. It's lack of motivation, right? I'm putting it in air quotes, we're coaches, we get it. But for people say, my child is lazy, unmotivated, unwilling, um, couch potato, you know, the kids or the individuals that um, cannot seem to start, get started on projects or lack willpower. In, in either following through or getting started or sustaining the attention. How have you worked as a coach to help those individuals? Yeah, that's a really good question. And not to get too research and science-based, but I studied this science behind procrastination and really looking into this idea that sometimes we can equate procrastination to laziness. Well, you're procrastinating because you're lazy or you just don't have the motivation, but there are emotions and feelings behind it and oftentimes it's trying to 
um, really get again to the root of what's behind the procrastination. Maybe this is the first time that you've been this challenge and you're afraid. It really scares you to sit down and open this assignment because you have nowhere to, you don't know where to start. Um, you're afraid of managing independently. Maybe the procrastination is coming because you honestly just don't understand the material, right? So now we're getting into tutoring and things like that. And so I always, you know, I, so when people are on that side of it, I, for one, let them know that like their experiences are valid, their thoughts are valid, and also let them know that they aren't lazy, right? You, and you also have to think about the reality of skill building. If you don't need a skill, if you've never had to get up an hour early to make sure that you get to class on time, that's new and it should be challenging. It will be challenging. So it doesn't mean that you're a failure. It doesn't mean that you're lazy. It means that you've come up to a roadblock in your life where you now need to develop a skill that you've never had to. Um, I met with so many first year college students who didn't even own a planner, never, never needed it. I mean, quite literally, Maggie, never needed it. Straight A student all the way from grade school to graduation. And they're sitting in my office saying, I don't, I don't even have a planner. And so I think you just meet, I meet my clients where they are and I don't make any assumptions. And I also never let them feel like their procrastination is linked to laziness because I want to get to the root of what may be contributing to it. Right. Thank you for bringing the science into it. I think that that is something that makes a lot of sense where kids that are struggling are struggling for all different types of reasons. And as we think through then, okay, how can I support a child who either has this perfectionistic ideology where their mindset is, I cannot fail, or the child that says, I'm really stuck here. I can't move forward. I don't know how to get started. I, you know, or I'm overwhelmed. And what would you do there as a coach meeting that child where they're at? Where would you begin? Yes, I think that's such a good question because I think a lot of times, you know, it can be hard to say, I need help. Um, a lot of times we can adopt the mindset of, I should know this by now. Why haven't I grown into this strength naturally? I'm 18 years old. Why haven't I developed a pattern of study habits? And the thing about executive functioning skills or just skill building, you don't naturally grow into them. You have to practice. You have to put effort in. You have to try. You just have to repeatedly, repeatedly put the time in. And so on the, on one end, we have, I used to be perfect. It's not working for me anymore. I'm a failure. Help me. And on the other end, it's, you know, why just, can, maybe I just am not supposed to do this. Maybe planning isn't for me. Maybe organization isn't for me. And so I like to meet the client in the middle and, and really meet them where they are and say, look, give yourself grace. First, let's just give yourself grace because you have gotten this far without needing these skills. So of course it's going to be challenging. However, I want to make sure that you maintain them and they can, you can be, you know, you can have these skills in every part of your life. So I want to help the client focus on the act of skill building. You know, people talk about muscle building muscles, you know, the, the going to the gym, the reference of, you know, why you hire a trader. It's simply if you, you know, felt that you could get the results on your own, you would do it. And there's absolutely nothing with needing support. And that's what I love about coaching and being a coach is that I can hold someone accountability or, account, or help with accountability and I can help them develop skills. I can say, okay, this week, here's the take home exercise. Um, you know, what, how did it go? Tell me what were the strengths? Tell me what you had difficulty with. And over time, clients begin to feel more comfortable. They're building their, you know, academic muscles, their well being muscles. And that's, that's skill building. It just quite simply is. And so that's how I approach it is having grace and meeting them where they are and also helping them understand if you don't put in the work and you don't commit to building that muscle, you're going to continue to be challenged in the same ways. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you've heard me say this before, but what I'll say to kids and adults is I have good news and bad news. Okay. The good news is that executive functions are learned skills acquired through routine practice. 
The bad news is that executive functions are skills <laughs> that are developed through routine practice. So in other words, on the one hand, it's really good news because it's not a magical fairy that comes down. You weren't born with a deficit and you're not going to die with a deficit. You can put in this work and change and see measurable results. However, without the example of going to the gym is a really good one, without the practice, with the accountability partner there, right? That you don't have to do this on your own. Any kind of goal we can help with. And if you put in the practice, you will start to see changes. Again, bad news, especially for teens that want results overnight. Executive functions are not skills that are built overnight. They're built through practice. But the exactly. good news is the more you practice it, the more it becomes your default and the easier those neural pathways are to grow. Then it becomes that groove that I use a planner now. I set a timer now. I don't wait until it's overdue now. It's really yes. exciting to see that. Maybe you can point, putting you on the spot a little bit, but maybe you can point to one example of a adult or a child that you worked with where they had one particular challenge and you knew that it was time to let them go. Because that's another question that families ask us is, how long is this going to take? <laughs> you know, And how do I know when we reach the mountaintop? How do I know when my child no longer needs an EF coach? How would you start to address those questions? Yes, I think of several students. To me, it's that moment as a coach that I love. I, so when I was at Vanderbilt, I gave my students permission to email me updates if they no longer needed coaching. If you just need to let me know your progress or have a quick check-in, email me. I'm okay with that. To me, the moment that I think you know, a coach we love is when a client says, hey, I actually don't think that I need consistent meetings anymore. I'm just emailing to share my progress. I'm emailing to let you know that I have successfully implemented X, Y, and Z for the last month, and I am doing well. And I think of a particular client who I worked with who went on to medical school, and we worked together for two years meeting bi-weekly. And I'm telling you, when we first started meeting, she did not use a planner, just hated it, um, could not make herself break down tasks. She could not say no to social obligations, or I say obligations, to social things so that she could say yes to academic. Or she would go so far in the direction where she would say no to all of the fun activities only to be so hyper-focused on academics that then she was not happy, right? And so we kind of went through that pattern for two years and, and she consistently grew and I saw the progress. And I would say in her last year, we went from meeting um, bi-weekly to then it was once a month. And then by the time she graduated, you know, reached back out to me once she got in medical school and said, hey, I just want to let you know, I still use this technique that you and I talked about two years ago. I, it's muscle memory for me at this point. Like I'm now over scheduling everything in my life. Like everything is on my calendar. And for me as a coach, that is what I want to hear because not only did she reach a point of independently management or managing it. I actually heard excitement behind it, right? I heard the enthusiasm to be able to do something well and see the benefit in, in learning that skill. And that has, you know, I've had several of those moments, but that's one that always will stick out to me. I love that. Isn't it crazy when it's, I will not use a planner, get the calendar away from me. I want nothing to do with any type of organization. And then it's, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> this helps, you know, particularly when it's my system, not Maggie or Janine's system, when it's the client's system, right? It, for so many years, frankly, I think kids are told what system they should use. And it's off-putting. I know I think of myself, if somebody says, this is the system that works for me, I think of even Pinterest boards, where I'm like, oh my God, this totally works, even for a friend of mine or somebody that I respect. And then I try to implement it in my own life and I go, this is not working. This is not the system that works for me. It's not the system that works for me and that's okay. But if it's no system as the default because the Pinterest system isn't working, we're in trouble, right? Exactly. I mean, that is, that's it. That's it right there of 
it doesn't, you can adapt your system and make it conducible to what you need. And you also don't need to do nothing, right? Like just like I always have this saying, like, let's start to start, right? Like let's start to start, make it conducive to what you need and let's adapt it as much as we need to. However, let's do something. And you just mentioned such a good point is that the system has to eventually have the ownership. You have to have the ownership of the system and you have to, you think about what makes you proud in saying, oh, this is my system because you know it works. And once clients get to that point, it's now just maintaining. And like I mentioned earlier, being flexible, being adaptable and knowing when to reach out for help because it's a lifelong process. Yes. Janine, thank you so much for carving this time out today. I know families are going to benefit from listening to you. We could talk all day about executive functioning. It's our, we're nerds about it. I like it, you know, and um, for families that want to reach out to you, for anybody who's interested in working with Janine, we'll put right on the website, your calendar to schedule an intake with you. Um, any final thoughts that you want to offer? Absolutely. I would just say thank you. This has been such, like you said, we could talk about this all day. Um, but I think the reason that I am so passionate, or I know the reason I'm so passionate about coaching is because I have seen it work in my life. And I think about the different experiences and stages. And there, we need different skills at different times in our lives. So, you know, parents who are watching this, adult clients, I just want to first like commend you for even coming to the website and, and thinking about how you can develop that skill. And I also want you to know that you're not going to have to do it alone. And it's going to, it may be challenging and it's going to require commitment, but that's what you have coaches for. And I'm so, so happy to be a part of the team. Wonderful. Thank you, Janine. Thank you. Thank you. We'll sign off now saying thank you. Take care. All right. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.